Amir and I talking through various aspects of uncertainty and, and error, which are different things, um, as we'll explain. And Lachlan McKenna, who works very closely with us, is a big integral part of our team, but happens to live in Australia, so he's asleep right now, um, also contributed a lot to this and contributes a lot to this in his day-to-day -day work, but obviously is not here in person. So, so we're going to kind of uh, tag in and out over the next two hours or so. And um, I think because of that, please make sure you do interrupt with questions when they come up. Um, otherwise, things could get lost in the thread. The last thing I wanted to say is, for me personally, this was like the, the hardest set of talks to write. And that's honestly because a lot of this stuff is, is not not so easy. For me, retrievals are very easy. It's, it's figuring out how good they are that's difficult. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we're, we're doing now that fundamentally isn't very different from the way things have been done for a few decades. There's a lot of stuff we know is an approximation that's not really that great. And it is taking, takes a while to figure out how to do a better job without screwing things up. Um, we have to learn from other fields. Um, so many measurement disciplines have, have these issues, whether that's forecasting or medical science, artificial intelligence. Um, and it's really kind of a, a big uh, effort to keep, of, keep up with what's going on in different disciplines and kind of learn new best practices. So between us, we're going to show you um, what, kind of what has been done and what we're doing now in terms of satellite validation on uncertainties and also talk a bit about some of the limitations of these methods and what we want to do going forward and um, what we have not figured out answers to yet. So in order to start that off, we need to have some basic definitions so we all are talking in the same, the same language here. Um, so this all comes down to metrology, which is the science of measurement. It's a real thing, not meteorology, metrology. Um, it means the, the, the study of measurement or the science of measurement. Now, there are standards for these things. There's a body called the um, International Bureau of Weights and Measures. This is their seal. I think it's pretty cool. This is meant to be a representation of, of the meter. There is a standard meter. I think it's digital now, but um, there was at one time a, you know, a thing that was one meter long, and they said, that's a meter. It also represents various other implements for the measurement scientists, um, whether that's geography and geodesy, or um, just, just weighing things. Um, and they, they chair, this, this BIPM, chairs this thing called the Joint Committee for Guides in Metrology. And they put out a document called the GUM, which is the, the Guide to Uncertainty in Measurement. Um, and this is something that's been adopted by the International Standards Organization and a lot of other organizations as a kind of a guideline for the specific words you should use when you want to talk technically about weights, measures, uncertainties, and errors. So we are trying to adopt these, um, these, these conventions in most cases. Though having said that, everybody makes mistakes with this. We all make mistakes. Papers are full of mistakes in terminology. We're probably making them today. Even during this talk, I'll probably get something wrong. That's OK. The point is just try and try and Think about the words you're, you're using when you can. Try and, try and do better if you make a mistake, correct yourself. And if someone, you know, if, if, if we make a mistake, if someone makes a mistake, try and nicely correct them. And it just kind of helps us make sure we're not saying something that's technically wrong and is going to lead to confusion or ambiguity down the road. So with that in mind, one of the, one of the really big things is, is accuracy and precision which are kind of related to bias and scatter. So often I'll read a paper and I'll, it will say, our method is very accurate. R squared is 0 0.9. And I think, that's junk. Because correlation is not a measure of accuracy. It's a measure of association. Accuracy is a measure of bias. So here I have a, a target. It's like an archery target. We used to do that when I was young. I don't know if people still do, like, not shooting animals, just shooting targets like this. It's like. Um, it's, it's, it really, it's really good, good for, your, for your arms. Um, anyway, and if you're a really good shot, which I was not, you might, you might really hit the center of the target all the time. So, so this is an example of, of uh, some arrows that have gone in, and they're very accurate. 
which means they're very focused on the, on the, the ideal value here. And they're also, uh, or, or rather, they're, they're, they're kind of not offset from this ideal value here in any one direction. And they're also very precise, which means they're very tight in. Everything is within this very central yellow circle. So maximum points or, or, or whatever. Now, suppose you instead shoot like this. These, these arrows are also very accurate. They're, they're centered around the middle, but they're less precise. They're kind of a lot more spread out distance-wise from the center. You can also have things which are not accurate but are precise. Here, they're all in this kind of top right-hand corner of the target, so not accurate but they're all in this top right-hand corner, which means they are precise. You can also have things which are neither accurate nor precise, which is where they kind of spread out around there. So those are some, some uh, common terms that I encourage you when you're writing your, your papers, your theses, when you're reading. Think about, is that the word I mean to use? Is that the word I should use? A couple of other words we often misuse are error and uncertainty. So error is strictly a measure of how wrong you are. If I say, I'm 15 years old, that's an error. That's obviously wrong. I'm a little older than that. But the point is, this is something we can define explicitly. It's the retrieved value minus the true value. So if you know what the retrieved and the true is, you know the error. In other circumstances, you don't know the error. So error is something we, most of the time, we don't know. Uncertainty, on the other hand, is some um, less well-defined measure of reliability. And it might be, what is the typical magnitude of the error under these conditions, either based on something I, be I believe or, or some evidence I have. So it's kind of how, how wrong you typically are or you think you typically are, as opposed to how wrong you are in this one specific case. So to recap, the error is a very definite thing, and the uncertainty is a measure that's inherently statistical in nature. And the way I like to, to give an example of this is if you roll a single die, what you expect is 3.5, but you can never roll that. You only get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. So one of these is a, is a definite outcome, and the other is an expectation of an outcome. And we can take this con... Um, go ahead. Um, so the, that's covered in the gum. That's not a term I particularly like to use because I think it can be um, ambiguous. I believe in some, in some cases the, the, the deviation is defined the same as as the error, so it's, it's, it's value minus truth. However, we also like to use the term standard de deviation to refer to the, 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 the dispersion of a, of a normal distribution. Um, and because the word deviation crops up in both of those, I don't tend to like to use deviation by itself. I like to say standard deviation specifically for standard deviation. Um, there's also s standard error, which is standard deviation divided by square root of number of points. But deviation by itself, for our specific field, I think it can be confusing. For some other disciplines, maybe this is not so much of a problem. And that's also why I say we mostly adopt gum conventions, um, because they offer, in some cases, several acceptable terms or definitions. Um, they sometimes make revisions to their document, so sometimes we're not always up to date with the latest. But it's good practice to stick to it when we can. Okay. Okay. The the next kind of series of terms are about uncertainty, and there are kind of two main ways to talk about uncertainty here. The first is diagnostic, which is when you're measuring or or talking about your uncertainty with respect to some reference truth that you might have. And that might be from some validation data you have you're comparing against, or it might just be from numerical simulations if you don't have any validation data yet. I mean, ideally, you, you want lots of high quality validation data that's kind of broadly representative. That means similar statistical distribution to, uh, to, to the way things occur on the Earth. 
That way you can make some representative conclusions. So it's, it's, it's diagnostic because it's trying to say this is the status with respect to the truth. And the way I like to think about that is you go to the doctor for your diagnosis when you're sick. So you say, you know, th this, this is how I'm presenting and the doctor diagnoses you with, with what's the deal. Now the alternative of that is, is a prognostic uncertainty. So prognostic means predictive. And there are various ways to do that as well, and Amir is going to talk about some of it later on. So that's when you're kind of trying to predict, your uns predict the uncertainty, predict the level of dispersion and your retrieve quantity by kind of propagating all your uncertainty sources through the, uh, the measurement system to your final result and see how it shakes out. So it's also kind of like a sensitivity study in a way. Um, you can also parameterize this if you can come up with some parametric model that represents your, un your, your observed errors as a function of conditions and use those errors to parameterize in an uncertainty model. Um, and this is, this is something that you can ideally also do on a pixel level. So you can make a prognostic uncertainty estimate for every single retrieval and ideally every single parameter. Whereas in diagnostic validation and uncertainty, you can often only make very general conclusions, like in these types of situations, the uncertainty is about this. Um, and prognostic uncertainty is predictive. It might be like, you could think of it like a medium or a psychic, but we hope we have a bit more skill than that. So maybe it's more like, I don't know, a weather forecaster or um, an economist. Or, I don't know, maybe that's not a good example right now. But the point is that both diagnostic and prognostic uncertainties are different directions of trying to understand what is, what is the uncertainty in my retrieval system, how different might I be from the truth, which I often don't know under certain conditions. And as kind of one final thought um, before I pass over to, to Ivona, um, is this quote from a, a paper from about five years ago. It is clear that developing and validating uncertainty estimates involves effort comparable to developing the retrieval itself. And that's a statement I really agree with. And one of the reasons I think that, as I said, I find this difficult and many of us find this difficult is generally we're not funded to do this. You, you, the, like the, the funding proposal comes out and it says we seek these new algorithms to do ABC or we seek innovative analysis doing this. And then it has like a paragraph that says you must provide uncertainties. But the real focus is on what are the scientific data products we're going to make. Um, and so a lot of the effort you have to demonstrate, you have to sell your proposal, uh, not so much on this kind of uncertainties, but on, on the products themselves. And then that can become a problem sometimes because you see people trying to do really technical scientific research with this and you think, well, you're probably pushing the limits of what's possible with this algorithm if you're using the data in this way. And it's, it's really hard to, to have somebody know how far they can push it unless you've well quantified your uncertainty budget. And that's something we're not directly funded to do in most cases, at least not explicitly. Um, so it really does take a lot of effort. And like I said, we're still catching up with how to effectively do it and um, stay in school and go to statistics classes and maybe you can do a better job than we can. So all these slides are on the Google Drive and I put a few references here for further reading and I hope at least one of you will be interested in, in doing this because it can be a lonely uh, task. <laughs> okay, um, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Otherwise, I'll pass to Ivana. This recent they'll work with some uh, economists um, to estimate, you know, using the uncertainty, I uncertainties, an improvement of uncertainties of observations of the carbon in the ocean, how much can they be, you know, if we improve the uncertainties of our current observations, they're plugged into the Earth system model, how much will that mean in money, you know? Because these uncertainties are associated with something called futures, whatever, they have like the whole lingo understanding how the, the, you know, 
how the climate is going to be affecting the economy, how the uncertainties in our propagation and understanding of future climate is going to affect the economy. And by lowering down these uncertainties, you're actually saving money. And you can turn that around and say, well, if we invest a billion dollar in pace, how much saving that in future is going to give us? So if you need a real world connection to that and you're interested in something like that, there was a beautiful paper that's been done, um, it's for Clario, I think. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I'll, I'll pull it out, but together with that economist and some of the NASA observation system. And I, I hope our paper is submitted. I'm going to go and box somebody's dean here. Sarah's dean has to submit that paper. But yeah, it's it's a really cool study. Kind of thinking thinking, thinking about these uncertainties outside of the, like, you know, we need to know better stuff. But, you know, when you, when you want to build vocabulary to talk to the policy people or something like that, what, um, I can't plug this in, um, that... Um, that Natasha and Aaron were talking about yesterday. That gives you another, you know, another thing and you know, another tool in an ar arsenal. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of like now take everything what Amir has explained and start kind of leading you slowly through the validation process in our lab to, val you know, that we use to validate ocean color products. Of course, I'm not going to be able to touch upon everything, but uh, in the end of the my my portion of the talk, there's going to be references and there's going to be links that you can follow up on, and I'm here for the rest of the week, it means a couple more hours, to answer your question, you know where to find me. Um, majority of these slides were given to us by CBAS people, the amazing, amazing CBAS people, um, led by Chris Proctor. So um, they're always available to you. If you have questions, um, want to submit data and stuff, please bug them, they love to be bugged. They're uh, unsung heroes, the same as people who make that CBAS thingy. Okay, what is CBAS? Um, my God, I don't have the definition. And I'm really bad with acronym. Okay, I, I can do it. CWIFS. Thank you. And this is like, you know, this is what Jeremy used to do when he was a little boy. Uh, but um, but CBAS was originally formed, you know, when CWIFS were launched because we need to validate our products. And I don't know how originally started, but, you know, they were really just interested in remote sensor reflectance and, and optical properties and chlorophyll. And that's why how it was envisioned, you know, in the beginning. And if you ask some people in the lab, they should stay this way. But because of many reasons, and one of them being PACE, and <laughs> other one probably being exports, there's so many parameters in there now that have to do with um, you know, remote the, thing, the things that we retrieve from satellite, but also have to do their, you know, if you want to develop new algorithms, if you want to, you know, for air system modelers, for everything. We have a measurement of every single thing in the ocean, not just in the ocean, sometimes atmosphere too. But it's a really, really powerful database. Um, based on Earth, system, Earth science under NASA, you have to deliver your data within a year of your collection to one of the public depositories under NASA. And if you're funded by ocean biology, biogeochemistry, your data will come to us probably. And you're going to find it in the CBAS. Um, CBAS. Once you submit the files, there's on their website, it's really, really lots of tools to explain you the format that we use. It's called SB. It's just a TXT thing. Heather with some metadata, data inside. They're, they're going to ask you for lots of additional documentation that I might discuss later on. But it's a, it's a very simple format. We'll give you the tools how to make it. Give us the data. Okay? And so they've been storing the data for a century now, at least, because we know that Jeremy is like around 150 years old. So, so this kind of gives you a general distribution of the data points, all the data points there. And, and again, as I said, we store discrete data, we store aircraft data too, <laughs> we store data collected by the ships, by the moorings, and so on. It's there, and most of it, or some of it, has been used for validation. So how does that process go? Um, as I used Luke a lot last night to explain the review process, uh, you, you don't, you're not aware of that stuff. You were the, you were the lead, <laughs> lead reviewer in a, a review process. I'm going to pick somebody out. So, for example, Noah. Noah goes in the field and collects some chlorophyll because Noah does that a lot. And he's going to submit the data. First thing that he's going to do is shoot an email to Chris or any one of our data managers to say, hey, I'm submitting data. They're like, cool, great, awesome. This is what we need. You have to format your data in this way. You have to submit uh, you know, protocols and everything how you submitted the data. The data is going to enter our system, and data managers are going to check for the format, and data is going to go towards one of our, um, how do we call them? People in field support group who do the quality control. So there's like a bunch of people in, in the field support group who currently are doing quality control on the incoming data, and they're actually going back in time 
to do data quality control. And each of the people, for example, I don't know, Amy, if you saw her, she was one of the uh, escorts the other day when we were at Godard. She's responsible for HPLC, absorption, uh, phytoplankton community structure, and things like that. She's going to check the data, and let's say Amy is going to check the format. And if the data passes, let's say the sauce and data, is going go to is gonna go down the line and pile up at this pile of things that I have to do, for example, because I'm responsible, I'm the, I'm the next step, I'm going to allow that data to become validation data. And it's not just me, any of these science leads that you saw around here, we're the final block from, you know, we're the final pass from getting the data from the just you submitting it to the higher quality data. We're going to do another check on them and say, look, this looks really good. Change the data around because we're really not interested in the whole water column data in case of oceanic data. We're just going to focus on the surface things, make some averages, try to calculate some uncertainties, and push the data towards the validation system. The data also be becomes a potential data for NOMAD. Who knows what NOMAD is? Okay, can you tell us what NOMAD stands for? Because I forgot. Oh, I don't know. Jeremy. Anyways, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> because I'm bad with acronyms and I don't have notes. But in theory, NOMAD, original NOMAD, and the NOMAD that's currently being developed, is a database of really high quality data. You have remote sensor reflectance, you have inherent, you have like lots of optical properties, um, you have some pigments in there, and it's a really high quality, high control database that you can use then to develop your algorithms. You know, it has this optical closure, it's been checked, we know really how good it is. It has flags, it has everything. It's there for you, available to do whatever you want with it. New incoming data is going to be pushed towards the Nomad. We're currently working on development of the new Nomad that is going to more be, going to be more PACE appropriate because PACE is going to do a little bit more than chlorophyll. So we're going to be adding, you know, many more additional pigments, hopefully some biogeochemical values as they come along, and that's currently under development. There is a return dash line here. And that return dash line happens because you messed up your format, and that happens to everybody. But this return dash line means that the data, if it's bad format or low quality, will be returned to the PIs. And this is a big problem. Um, again, NASA Earth says that you have to give us the data within a year. There's people who are going to just dump any junk in our direction. And sometimes they've been used to dump any junk in our direction. But you just have to know that if you dump junk in our direction, we're going to have to spend the same amount of time to check that junk. We're going to push it back to you, and we're not going to have data to validate our algorithms with. And that's a big problem. So in the last couple of years, we've been working really, really hard, including implementation data quality and data checking, with the community to make sure that data is a really high quality. If you remember, Amir was saying in order to, you know, for validation, we have really, we really need high quality data. So together with the community, we've been working on a bunch of different protocols to agree upon proper ways or suggested ways of measuring different things in the ocean. This is not something that we woke up right. We work really closely with them. So this is just an example of a couple of them. They're dear and near to my heart, and I was involved with. Um, you know, the, the one that I'm most excited about is this crazy thing up there on top that we actually got funded by OCB to do, which facilitates the way to take phytoplankton community structure data, so imaging data, and transferring them in some meaningful format that can be used then further on for, um, for validation. And this is something that we it was not only NASA working on, but it was NASA working with NSF, which is National Science Foundation funds similar, you know, similar things. So it's hopefully <laughs> going to be the same across majority of the databases, which is awesome, no? On the other side, we have also been some, uh, developing some software. And this is a great work done by um, Dirk Oren, who developed this Hyper in Space, doo -doo 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 -doo, which is a software available for you, which is going to allow you to process remote sensing reflectance, you know, get to remote sensing reflectance data of any field deployed radiometers. It's really awesome. It's really useful. I mean, if I asked him a couple of slides about it, I would get 70 slides at least because he really loves it, but he really gave you know, his heart and soul into it. So if you deal with remote sensing reflectance data measured in C2 from any kind of instrument, use this. It's freebie. It's, um, I think I put a link on the GitHub in the end. So once we have this good data, uh, do these protocols, what do we do? We take this protocol and actually make it as a protocol for the submission of the data. So for example, this one for measurement of a particular organic carbon, we put that as a requirement in our submission. So there's specific metadata fields that you have to fill up and check 
it facilitate us, you know, making, um, you know, deciding if that's good data or not. Because you would be surprised what people define as carbon and submit to our direction. You know, being on this side is really amazing because I know everybody's dirty laundry. So, um, and I don't know, people just have to remember that we do review proposals as well. So, <laughs> so what did this happen? Just as a statistics of measurement, we started implementing this in 2018. So this is the old data. And um, we have a couple of things that we define as needed to be to have, um, you know, to consider particular organic carbon measurement and C2B in good measurement. The old data prior to 2018, you can see that 92% are not good. They're actually not particular organic carbon. There are many, many different things, but not carbon. I mean, they're carbon, but not particular organic carbon. And since 2018, um, it almost 95% of the data being submitted to their database is actually particular organic carbon, which is great, which means that working together with the community and yelling and going in fights and stuff works. Um, so this is great because now we have that high quality data that Andy was talking about and we can go, yes, towards the validation and implementation, uh, implementation to NOMAD. Thank you. How are you evolving things? I mean, this is, yeah, uh, I mean, thanks to export, not a lot. <laughs> so uh, um, I don't know, this, we're talking about like total of, I mean, there's a mar much larger data volume here. But let, let's talk about maybe, maybe it's better. I actually have this color based on different PIs, but then people were afraid that I'm gonna name them. So um, <laughs> let's say that uh, in this gray region, this, this region and this region, the PI people, PI have not changed, but majority of PI have switched. Is, is that more helpful? I mean like, you know, in this, I think we have maybe around 1,000, 2,000 data points here, out of which not all of them are gonna be validation quality because they're too deep or under the clouds and stuff. I mean, they're validation quality, but we cannot validate. I don't want to know who makes that data. I just want to know the good data. Yeah, is it, it's, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not this is like, uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't know the actual numbers, but I mean, the vault, the incoming volume has not changed, has actually increased, right. but the quality has increased as well. Right. So, uh, the, the, that's the idea. It's, this is a relative, just like, you know, whatever's coming down our line, it's, it's better. Because one good stuff is the majority of the PIs who are submitting that type of data to us were working with us in this protocol. And there was a consensus with the community. It's not like I woke up this morning, it's like, okay, everybody's measuring POC or doing Ivona style. No, nothing else, you know, it's my way or highway, no. There was lots of conversations there that we agreed upon and that was really good. And, and, and it's an international community. So it's not like it's just US versus the world. You know, it, it has a trickling effect towards Europe, towards all our collaborators in Australia and across the world. So that's great. So anyways, we're getting better data, less junk we have more data to validate and push it towards the uncertainties. So what actually happens when you want to validate the data and when you have now finally the great data point that you, you want to focus on, this is the pipeline. I have to talk so you can, guys can hear me and I can see what I'm showing. This is the pipeline, the magic that happens somewhere behind uh, in the magic, in magical dragons work and stuff. Once you have this in situ data, you have latitude, longitude, timestamp associated with it. It's a, it's a surface data. There's no clouds and stuff like that. No, we, we, we don't know if it's clouds. You go through this pipeline where like based on latitude and longitude and, and timestamp of the in-situ data, you start pulling, pulling out satellite data. Um, and, and this is like a bunch of different things that happen. You know, like there is um, first you limit it based on space, then you limit it based on time. You check all the flags, you pass all the flags. You know, you pass the timestamp. We have a pretty big, big window and pretty, I think, large sp spatial window, but we're hoping in future maybe we're gonna make some kind of like changes to that based on heterogeneity of the water, maybe, we'll see. I mean, this stuff is working for now, so let's push it that way. And go on and go on and go on, go on, lots of questions, you know, lots of checkups, yes, no. After all these checks are set, the things, you know, the remote sensing data passes the validation criteria and it can be paired and happily married with our NC2 data. And if you go, um, to our website, you actually can you know, run validation by yourself and you're gonna get this data that has passed the validation check. And once again, I have an example from particular organic carbon because it's near and dear to my heart. And this is currently what you can see on the website. There's still junk in this data. 
Okay, we're working through this process, so there, there's some junkish data, there's some bad data that I've talked about before, but what you can see is the output you, you are currently getting where you have in C2 product or reference product, you have retrieved product, you, ha you see like either your X and Y, uh, your typical scatter plot, you see the distribution, and you see some statistics. And you can see that these statistical measurements are actually kind of taking consideration stuff that Amir, uh, Andy, oh my God, uh, one of these days I'm gonna start correcting your names. Um, you, got, you guys are so similar. I mean, they're, they're literally sitting office next to each other. They look, you mean like twinsies, no? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna go in a whiteboard question. Uh, anyways, uh, so statistical, s statistics that currently are presented on a website are following the recommendations of the paper by Bridget, who's part of our team as well, not here. Um, she does usually, she does some amazing work and she published this like really cool paper with, about metrics that we can use in order to you know, define these statistics that can be useful for validation purposes. And that was really cool. But following all these implementations that we wanted to do for PACE, and following the fact that these metrics do not take in consideration the uncertainties, and we are really you know, getting to the point to be able to understand the uncertainty, to have uncertainties coming from the validation, from the in situ side, and also as Amir, when he wakes up, he's gonna explain you about the uncertainties coming from the remote sensing side. We really wanted to develop statistics that are a little bit better and take in consideration those uncertainties coming from both sides of the measurement. So um, in his paper, I get the, oh yeah, McKenna et al, 2021, McKenna and the team have actually really looked in different ways how we can take these uncertainties and plug them in a metric that we're currently using, no? So by taking consideration uncertainties, you get these like, you know, let's say bias and bias prime and you can see that they actually improve in statistics because bias prime, can it get bi it's a typical cal calculation of the bias, but it's teeny tiny bit corrected by taking consideration the uncertainties coming from both sides of the measurement, no? And the same thing with all the other um, estimates of the, um, you know, of, of quality of, of this validation or of, uh, you know, <laughs> how good this validation is. I'm afraid not to use the word so I don't like mess up <laughs> the, the nomenclature. When anything that we're gonna change, we're really hoping to change the graphical representation. Now, you heard me express, expressing my um, displeasure with log-log scale. I agree that chlorophyll is logarithmically distributed in the ocean most of the times, but you know, um, it's okay, but it seems to me it, it, it's hiding stuff, and it's really, you can't, if you wanna evaluate your data, I can't really see the trends, and I'm really into seeing the trends. So we're gonna turn around the things, and this is also, precipitated by the existence of <laughs> Kirk in our lab. And if you ever wanna you know, lose 16 hours of your life, bump into Kirk Nobelspies, I can't pronounce his na last name, and to ask him about bland Altman plots. And, and it's gonna be uh, you know, 16 hours of your life that you're never gonna get back. But <laughs> bland Altman plots are really cool because what it's showing, you're showing the same thing as their scatter plot. We're gonna leave the scatter plot because otherwise somebody's gonna kill us. But what Blend Alpha is actually showing you um, a method average, so taking both of the measurements, both in C2 and both from remote sensing, so reference and remote sensing produced on x-axis. And here on the y-axis is the difference between those two measurements. So for me, this is kind of pretty cool because I can see, okay, I have some problems in this range. This is for backscattering, for example. I have some problems in this range and I have these problems in this range. Okay, so like algorithms obviously, you know, overperforming here and underperforming here. I really like this. It's kind of like cleaner than a scatter plot, at least in my head, no? And one thing that you can do is take it one step further and calculate zeta score. And zeta score is pretty much the difference between the two measurements divided by the a combination of the uncertainty of both of the measurements. And what is really cool about zeta score is that these little values, two, 3.5 and more than 3.5 are measurements of how good the stuff is. In simplistically, simplistic turn, I'm not gonna use precise, accurate stuff, like how good the stuff is. And, and so if these little dots, if the zeta score of our algorithms, retrieval full, full in the green, that's good stuff, no? Yellow is like <laughs> and red is like no good. And why I like this red, red green, yellow stuff is going back to our applications and people who are gonna be using our algorithm. If I tell them zeta score, you know, they're gonna go like, but if you tell them, 
Green's good. Yellow is like passable and, and red's not good. It's a really cool graphical representation. I really like it a lot. You know, you just really don't have to know a lot about statistics. You just have to try, trust us that we're doing a good job. But you see the color and you can see that this algorithm, whichever one it is, is performing well. Uh, not really. So, but let me let me let me get to that point because that kind of goes back to, to Dulce's question about validation and stuff. Okay, that you had a question. Yes, you did. So, um, so this is what you're going to be seeing there. Um, when you go to ATBD, that magical ATBDs that have to be updated and stuff. On the bottom of the page, after the explanation on our website, what are we doing? How are we doing? You're going to see also like a links or just images of this validation. So in theory, it's it's on top it's on you to check how good are we performing. Yeah, I I, I we don't have really a way to push this back, um, except publishing this stuff. Um, I put the references on top, but um, okay, I wanted to put this here. So validation again tells us how good the stuff is go is is doing. And, and all this magical stuff and everything. But, but one thing that is really important from validation points, a number of validation points, it goes back to the question Dulce was asking. Uh, within NASA, we have this designation of maturity level of the data, of the products. And they kind of is connected to something that Jeremy was mentioning yesterday. And you can see it's actually characterized by the number of validation points and, and how good your validation is. So is it really geographically distributed? If all your validation points come from that place with movie is, I don't think the validation is really well geographically distributed. But if you are actually captured the whole range and different geographical locations, your validation is better. Therefore, your data is, m your product is more mature. So I put the link down here and you can see as you're going from stage val val one validation to four, you're getting actually to more mature algorithm. Algorithm is much more characterized algorithm that you can trust much more. Not just trust because it's performing really well, but at least the uncertainties is really, really well characterized and is taking consideration all dif different optical characteristics of whatever you, whatever fluid you're studying. You know? so, so validation feeds into that. But these numbers are not something that, you know, when you download, we're going to give to you. Hey, by the way, current retrieval of chlorophyll, you know, is, you know, a zeta score is 1.3. No, it's there for you. It's you as user, we can't really push a shove it out of your nose. It's you as user have to go and check this stuff up. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, this is my part. This is how the validation works. There's lots of things that I have not talked about. Lots of little precise things and little things and things that I even don't understand because dragons do that. But there are some references here that you can look up of the things that I have uh, spoke about. Our IOCCG protocols that we have been working on are published here. The 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 little software that I was mentioning for remote sensing reflectance, um, you know, for processing radiometer data is here. And the CBAS validation process and, and that interface where you can play by yourself is here. Um, there's so many other tools on CBAS website that you can look like, you know, this, just, just go and dig. It's really a fun place. If you're writing proposal and you want to show something and you don't have data in hand because you're asking to go on a field to do stuff, you can actually get the data from there and test your hypothesis. Um, so, yeah, that's it um, for my side. Now we go back to Amir, and he's going to like hit you on RRS. But if you guys have any questions, I think the same theme is going to continue through the rest of the stuff. You can ask me, you can ask Amir, whoever. I think I, I don't believe maybe it. maybe a break after this. Uh, yeah, after this, okay. we we're good with time. Okay. All right, thank you, Vaughn. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <Isn't that happening>? <laughs> <laughs> I know our accents sound exactly the same, <laughs> too, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, well, no, thank you, Vaughn. Actually, she, uh, Vaughn really introduced all the important concepts that um, uh, I will talk about partially here in this talk. So I may sound like a broken record here, but <laughs> again, I wanted to show you guys this important slide, which is the requirement um, for the uh, where we're leaving reflectance. So why do we do validation? We want basically to validate our RS product post-launch, make sure that we have the capability or we to basically meet these requirements. So we need a lot of data points. We need to aggregate a lot of statistics. 
and then we do our validation process, and then we look at the baseline uncertainty here, the mean square error, whatever, for uh, these different parts of the spectra, and then we basically say, okay, are we actually doing well or not? So this is not something not gonna happen right away after launch. We still need to aggregate a lot of data points and a lot of statistics. And, and the way we validate uh, RS product is, of course, we have to get to the RS from the satellite data, as well as the in-situ data or independent measurements. So we need to accumulate a lot of data points and then we do basically the matchup process by aggregating that data and then we look at the validation metrics and see if we meet these requirements. So as I want to explain, how do we validate our operational products? We use a CBAS data set and there is the website, the CBAS website where we basically can go search and query basically um, either specific field campaigns or specific uh, uh, projects and then you can also look at what products do you want to validate. You know, we validate IOPs as well as RS and some aerosol products like the Angstrom and AOT, which we produce operationally um, um, from, from our uh, data set. And uh, uh, we can look at the data sources, the CBAS data sources, as well as uh, the Aeronet uh, OC measurements or, or measurements from the vicarious calibration side that Jeremy talked about, the MOBI side. Um, and then we basically can look at um, uh, what sensor do we want to use to validate? You know, MODIS, VIRS, AQUA, what, uh, uh, COS, whatever. And we're comparing it to the in-situ data or we can even do a matchup uh, relative comparison between two different satellites. Um, here we, uh, we have some kind of exclusion criteria metrics. So these are basically uh, things that you can specify um, you know, the, the maximum solar geometry that you want or a viewing angle and what is the a time difference that you want to do. So you can really have the flexibility to basically filter out what kind of validation data you have. We will likely end up changing this a little bit. We might actually um, put a range instead of just like maximum values and that would can allow us to basically do more like stratified analysis for validation. That would be very useful uh, and probably add more uh, uh, filtering criteria. So that, that's something uh, we're working on. Hopefully we, we should have it for, for PACES as well. So, uh, so in order to basically do the validation, we still need the in situ measurements, the in situ radiometry. So uh, we're mainly relying in, on two primary sources of this data. The first one is the Aeronet uh, OC sites. So uh, these are uh, about there are about like 27 sites around the, uh, the globe. Um, they're not as extensive as the Aeronet aerosol sites, uh, but uh, nevertheless, they are very very useful for validating. RRS, they're mostly uh, uh, located in coastal waters, uh, as you can see here from these red dots. Uh, and, and on top of that, we have, of course, the uh, shipborne measurements, um, where basically people go out on the ship or field campaigns or cruise, cruises and, and install their uh, radiometry and on the ship and basically take these measurements and then submit it to, uh, to the uh, CBAS data, uh, database. This is actually an image uh, that I took myself from uh, NOAA Calva Cruise in 2014, uh, where we basically had a lot of radiometry measurements, uh, HyperSAS, um, ASD, so many kind of radiometry that was basically, uh, Ryan actually was with me on that cruise too. <laughs> uh, and, um, and a lot of this data got submitted to, uh, to the CBAS uh, database in order to basically do the validation. So, Doing validation, you still have to do these uh, this matchups, right? So you have from a satellite image, um, you can basically, um, you have to consider the spatial temporal variability. So Ivana showed that there is this flow diagram where you basically select your criteria. What is the size of the uh, um, box around the matchup? Is it gonna be three by three, five by five? It depends on the conditions that you're looking at. Of course, you have to standardize it, but you can still have the flexibility to change that when you do your own matchups. Of course, and of course the, uh, the, the temporal variability is very significant. So you can see from this image, this is actually from GOSI. And um, I believe this is an hourly image, um, hourly observation. So you can see you know, in, in, in coastal water, of course the, the, there is a, mo a lot more significant uh, variability, um, spatial variability uh, and temporal variability compared to perhaps in, in, in open water conditions. So all of these considerations we have to account for when we do validation, depending on the water conditions we have. 
And uh, the same thing, this is Heiko image, where you basically, uh, this is Lake Erie, you can see the plumes uh, of the, uh, the blooms of the, um, I believe it's cyanobacteria. Um, and it's highly, highly spatially uh, variable. Um, the, and these are some, some in situ data, so when you do matchups, you have to also be careful about it. So doing this for Heiko, the, uh, the, the spatial resolution is about 90 meters. From OCI, we're not going to observe that. It's going to be at least one kilometer. So this, of course, add to the uncertainty in the validation process. <laughs> so the CBAS, uh, the web-based interface, uh, I actually took this uh, yesterday. Uh, this is the latest interface that we have from, the, from CBAS uh, validation. Uh, this is the table of the aggregate statistics, basically, where you show the range of the data and the mean absolute error based on uh, the paper by Seegers, um, as well as the mean bias. So something tell us about the, the pre precision and the accuracy of the measurements. Um, and th this is basically the scatter plot, the traditional scatter plot that we know, and this is histogram. And then as Ivana added that we're adding this bland Altman type of plot. Yes, Ivana. Yeah. The problem that uh, you also added that the system did was Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Oh, yes. Oh. I might have flipped. Uh, well, this is actually a slice from uh, Chris, so I did not probably pay attention <laughs> when I put it back. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Chris is not here. I blame Chris Proctor. <laughs> or I blame myself. I didn't really pay attention to it. Yeah. I'm responsible for that part. But it's. Uh, the for for this is actually a new new type of figure that we're uh, we're still I'm I'm still uh, this is basically the percent difference here or the re relative difference. Um, what do you mean relative? Exactly. That when I saw that, I was like, why are we doing this? We're we're this we're is still this. we're working on this, guys. So. <laughs> We're still debating, uh, it should be absolute difference or percent difference, what kind of, uh, uh, how, how are we going to show basically the, um, um, you know, the, the plot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are, these things are going to specifically, you know, drastically change when Heiko Spica comes along. But one thing that is important to see here is how much more information are you actually gaining from that versus just a classical scatter plot, at least in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, I'm mean like, th these kind of figures are really useful too because it kind of shows you the, um, you know, the, 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 the bias at different parts of the uh, dynamic range as well as the, the, the scatter. Uh, so, you know, as you can see here, this huge scatter is basically because uh, um, the, the, the relative difference is significant because the water, uh, uh, the RS at, at that band is very, very small. So of course it amplifies, you know, that, that percent difference. So, so we're we're still trying to figure out what is the best way to to visualize this kind of data. Is, is the RRS frequency distribution bimodal because there are different neophytes going on? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, there could be. Uh, yeah, typically I've seen a lot of bimodal distributions from that because m primarily most of. I believe this is from, this is all of the matchups. Yeah, this is CBAS and Aeronet OC. So a big portion of that is coastal waters. And then there is some still significant portions from the open ocean. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Open ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the problem with this validation data set is it's uh, over-representative in coastal water and less so in the open ocean. So it's a very um, um, challenge to kind of derive conclusion about the performance. But the good thing is that if we know that we're doing well in coastal water, which is a very challenging uh, um, region to do proper atmospheric correction, then we know that we're probably doing a good job in the open ocean. 
Uh, there, are, there is also the uh, times new time series uh, tool where you basically uh, can look at the uh, time series of the remote sensor reflectance uh, at any uh, errant OC or vicarious calibration site uh, for, for various products and you can basically bend the data you know, weekly, monthly or seasonally. Um, I believe this tool was developed by uh, Joel Scott um, and, uh, and Chris Proctor. So this is also a, a really nice tool where you can basically overlay the in-situ data with uh, satellite observations from, you know, from different sensors. So, uh, and you can download this data and you basically do your, your own analysis. So uh, next I um, wanted to again go back to validation metrics, right? So I showed from the table before that uh, we're, we're basically looking at the mean absolute error on the bias but is that sufficient? You know, so these are questions that we're raising. So according to the IOCCG uh, um, uh, report uh, 18 uh, by Frederick Nolan, basically he showed that you need at least some of these metrics, like the mean bias, mean absolute error, root mean square error, and uh, mean absolute relative error, as well as something called the centered statistics, where you basically um, remove the bias from all of these metrics. So you're basically trying to look at the, the errors uh, after uh, the bias correction. So these, some of these metrics could be useful for specific applications. So um, <coughs> it, depends on, uh, it depends on the performance of the algorithms and if you have like a bi you know, consistent bias in the atmospheric correction, for example, and you want to look at the you know, accuracy versus precision, you, you, can use a you can use a lot of these um, metrics including center statistic to look at the, um, at the performance. Um, and also I wanted to highlight that, remember the uh, requirements were basically written uh, in terms of the root mean square error. So we still need to basically calculate RMSE if you want to compare the uncertainty um, in the validation relative to the requirements. Um, so additional <laughs> validation diagnostic tool. <laughs> Uh, so this is a really uh, interesting paper that uh, by Kelsey Bisson uh, that we worked on, uh, I don't know, with Jeremy, like, year, like three, maybe we've been working on for three years, where basically Kelsey uh, tried to do independent validation of the backscattering um, uh, coefficient from uh, uh, Calliope um, relative to Monus Aqua. And what she found is that there is strong seasonal bias of the backscattering signal uh, backscattering coefficient relative to the ocean color measurements. So li LIDAR backscattering um, does not, is, is more or less flat seasonally, but you actually see strong seasonality in the ocean color uh, backscattering. And yes? Does this have anything to do with the what we heard from Dan Bond earlier? It is related, yeah. It is related, and I'll touch upon this a little bit, but um, it's still, um, um, we're, we're actively working on solving this issue. Um, primarily, this problem is coming from uh, the uh, issue with the atmospheric correction. So what we found is that the remote sensor reflectance is actually seasonally biased. And uh, this is actually an example of the RRS uh, ratio uh, from um, MODIS relative to uh, in situ data from MOBI. And what we found is that there is this strong seasonality here and it's very much uh, solar angle dependent, it's solar zenos angle dependent. So, um, so we're basically uh, trying to dig a little bit into more into this and we wanted to know what is really the source of the, uh, the seasonal bias. So we developed uh, this multiple linear regression tool or analysis where we basically uh, said, okay, I we don't know where is the seasonal bias coming from. Is it coming from the something in the atmospheric correction? Uh, is it coming from the aerosol correction, BRDF, uh, um, ancillary data, maybe the ancillary data like ozone correction or water vapor or something is seasonally biased causing this artifact. So what we ended up doing is we basically uh, did the multiple linear regression where we said that uh, we have the uh, in situ data and we tried to model that, uh, and we tried to model the, uh, the uh, satellite data as um, uh, using basically this multiple linear regression analysis where uh, we tried to estimate the coefficient uh, for the multiple uh, from, from this equation basically that tells us how much 
the, uh, the, the satellite data depends on for each of these parameters. And maybe I butchered it a little bit, but <laughs> uh, basically the idea is that we, uh, we looked at the, we tried to look at the coloniality or the dependence of the, um, the relationship between the in situ RS and, and modus, uh, the in situ RS and modus aqua um, relative to um, w in a when you have basically um, ex some expected collinearity for other parameters like such as the solar uh, zenith angle, sensor zenith angle, relative azimuth angle, things like wind speed, glint, water vapor, uh, o ozone pressure, uh, and other parameters relative to the aerosols. So the idea is that assuming that none of these um, auxiliary parameters depend on the, uh, or have an impact on the uh, retrieval of RRS, what we should expect is from this force plot here is that we should have this, these beta coefficients to be ideally one, that's mean that the, uh, the RRS in situ is highly correlated to the RRS from MOBI, and you should see all of these beta coefficients to be zeros, meaning that there is no dependence or collinearity between between the satellite and the uh, satellite and the in situ data uh, relative to all of these other parameters. That's the ideal scenario. That's what you would see is like these coefficients here for our for us MOBI should be one and everything else should be zero. But when we do this kind of analysis, we don't see that. So we see actually issues uh, primarily where we see strong dependence uh, or relationship for RS, MOBI and, and aqua on the solar geometry, as well as things related to the BRDF and the aerosol optical depth. So definitely there are some issues with the, um, with the atmospheric correction that we're trying to figure out and address. Uh, and one of uh, these things that we're working on with Peng Wang is basically what we found is when we uh, replaced uh, the, uh, aerosol, the atmospheric correction lookup table with a new radiative transfer code, a lot of these issues disappeared. So we are suspecting some of these issues coming from biases in the aerosol correction. And uh, we we're, we're actually have very encouraging results and seems to have resolved this issue, but we're tr still trying to figure out exactly what happened was, was this, uh, what really went wrong with the aerosol modeling. So challenges with, yes. Are there any what? Yes. Yeah. Any one of them where you're like, well, it's not going to be the same thing. Not at all. Yeah, I, I was really surprised because this is at the Mobi Vicarious Calibration site. Uh -huh. um, so I was really surprised to see, for example, that you can predict with the solar angle at 547 better than the in-situ <laughs> data itself. So there is way stronger dependence on the solar, uh, the sensor angle, for example, than the in-situ data. So the problem is there are two issues with, with this. One is the signal in the blue, the signal in the, in the green wavelengths is very, very small. Green and red is very, very small. Okay, so any small uncertainty will really amplify it. So, um, and the other issue is because we're looking at the data at MOBI, the dynamic range is very small. It's very stable water conditions, the variability is very little, so you really have a cluster of data points, and when you do this kind of multiple linear regression, it becomes a little bit dif difficult to tease out. So that's, that's some of these issues that comes with it. But, th but it just gives us a general idea of like how well are we doing, and, and if we have, you know, if we see something like that, then we know, okay, something is wrong. There is still residual issues in the atmospheric correction that we have to, we have to consider. Yes. Yes, yes, that's in Kelsey's paper. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was another question here. Okay. Um, so now, uh, just want to mention the challenges with validating PACE RS. So of course, we're moving hyperspectrally. So these are more like I'm <laughs> just raising questions for you guys to think, <laughs> help us think about. <laughs> Uh, okay, how are we gonna validate uh, RS at 239 wavelengths? Are we actually gonna validate 239 wavelengths? Probably not, because you know, like big portion of that is in dark ocean. We're not gonna, we don't really need it. We just need to validate, you know, UV to maybe near infrared. But still, you have like 170 or so wavelengths 
So are we gonna like put 170 scatter plot? You know, how are we gonna vi visualize all this information? These are questions that we're, we're raising and we're actively talking about right now. Well, also things like what metrics are we gonna use? Are these sufficient metrics? Uh, are the IOCCG uh, metrics sufficient to do this analysis or not? Do we need to look at new metrics? Maybe something like the spectral angle or uh, or something like the apparent visible wavelengths, which Ryan actually uh, <coughs> developed, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit uh, in the next slide. Um, visualizing the data, now we're planning to produce pixel level uncertainty, as well as uh, we need to consider the uncertainty in ACQ measurements. How are we gonna consider this information? So Ivona talked about the uh, blend outcome plot, uh, the Z-score plot, so this is something will help us with that. Um, Flagging, how are we gonna flag the data? Uh, do we need better flagging techniques and so on? Also, one important question is like if we have multiple algorithms producing the same product, let's say if we have four different algorithms that produce RRS, how, do, how are we going to know which algorithm is better? You know, they might not retrieve at exactly the same conditions. Uh, the, do we need to use different metrics to, for each algorithm and so on? So we have to compare the relative performance for all these kind of things. Um, so of course, as I said, we're going hyperspectral. So this is a paper from um, Oshia where he basically was comparing the uh, hyperspectral RS in situ to HICO. So actually this HICO data was processed using the CDES, um, the, uh, the CDES package. And, um, and this was done, I believe, in Lake Erie. So you can see you know, the spectra and variability and magnitude and shape and so on. So yeah, you know, if you have a few data points, you can basically plot some of these things and uh, look at the spectra and it's like, that's reasonably well, doing reasonably well, not so, but how are you gonna, you know, go beyond the hyperspectral? These are the kind of questions we wanna look at. Finally, um, uh, so Ryan also, uh, as I said, was developing this uh, AVW, apparent visible wavelengths, uh, where he basically look at the uh, changes in the color of the ocean hyperspectrally. So he uses this uh, metric here, where we basically um, uh, can be applied to uh, any kind of sensor, hyperspectral, multispectral. And what we can do with it is uh, develop a qu uh, quality flag, qualitative flag, uh, where basically um, this is a paper by Heidi Gerson and Ryan working on this, where they look at the AVW uh, versus a normalized different index, something like NDVI. And they basically, what they saw is based on some sample data set from Heiko uh, that, oops, that um, any data points within these bounds uh, have, have good quality and you can accept it. And a, any data points outside these bounds here can be rejected. And you basically can look here at the accepted data hyperspectrally. It looks a lot more like what you would typically see from you know, in situ measurements, a lot cleaner, nicer. And this is all the filtered data from uh, from the, the from this uh, quip flag, uh, where you basically can see that a lot of these spectra doesn't even look, <laughs> you know, like like reasonable RS. So uh, so qualitative flags like that would be very important for us. Um, in addition to, of course, looking at the pixel level uncertainties and so on. So um, but but we still have to think about like how are we going to look at the data hyperspectrally and what are the best metrics for for hyperspectral data. Um, and if you have any suggestion, please come talk to me. <laughs> uh, and um, I think that's it. So.